It's Abyss time, baby. Good evening. Welcome back to the Abyss. Tonight, we're drinking Headcase Hazy IPA from Mother Earth Brew Co. 7.2% alcohol by volume. What do you think? it tastes pretty damn good. Good. I love Indian pales, pale ales. I know, IPAs are my favorite. They get a hard rap from some people. They're like, oh, it's the fancy beer. You have to drink the fancy, fancy beer. It's, it's so floral and delicious. Yeah. Just... Tastes Ooh, that good. one's I don't smooth. Really grab it. Yeah, that one's really smooth. Good. But again, in typical fashion for me, I went straight for the can. The can's really cool. It's got like a, a retro skull on it, which is really cool. But also, so I had some uh, friends over the other night, and they brought uh, a whiskey. Uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's I guess it's pretty high end. It's supposed to be pretty good. Um, I had a little bit at the house. Yeah, took a sniff of that. <laughs> a sniff. <laughs> so um, I don't know. I'll have to look it up and try it. But uh, let me get out my lighter. Cheers. See burns. All right, here we go. Cheers. <laughs> you can't tell me that tastes good. No. So Cleet, you just took a drink of Malort. Oh. <laughs> have you heard of Malort before? Oh. No. <laughs> Oh, that is so bad. So, Malort is one of the nastiest alcohols they've ever made. It and just I, kept coming, too. Yeah, it's like oily. It is... Ho- oh, God. Ah. And I was a trooper because I did one last night, and I did it again today knowing how awful it was. That um, was 50 shades of crap. It doesn't go oh away. God, it's oily man, it's and shitty. There. So those of uh, the listeners who've never heard of Malort, I guess like in the 20s and 30s, like they used it for like medicinal properties for like stomach aches and stuff. It is awful. It's like a party in my mouth and everyone's throwing up. Yeah, it's horrible. Nasty shit. How dare you do that to I me? Know, I'm sorry. You have to blame, you have to blame Curtis. Ugh. That's, that's uh, courtesy of Curtis. But, oh God, it's still in my mouth. So, uh, if you've had Malort, write in and tell us what you thought about it. If you haven't, try it. Or don't. It's nasty. I don't think I've ever winced that bad in a sh- Yeah, like, that's horrible. It's not ever good. Ever taking a shot. Oh my. It's not good at okay. all. <clears throat> okay, so anyway, tonight we're doing a viewer submission. A listener submission. I think I just ruined Cleet's whole night. Ugh, I ruined my own night. That's horrible. Um... That's Holy how we, that's shit! How you cure alcoholism. It's like, yeah, right. Oh, there. you can drink, but that's all you can have. Yeah. You want some drink? Here's some Malort. <laughs> I'm probably still drinking. <laughs> <laughs> You're <laughs> like, if that's all I get to get me through the days. <laughs> um, but yeah, we're doing a, a listener submission um, from someone who wrote in Jackson, and uh, he wrote an email. I'll just read it real quick. Hi guys, love the podcast. I listen to it all the time. It always gets me through work. Anyway, I think you should cover the disappearances of the Yuba County Five. It's a very interesting case, and I'd love to hear your thoughts and theories on it. Anyways, love the podcast, and keep it up, Jackson. Jackson is a sponsor of the show, and if you guys ever want to become a sponsor, you can just click the link in the description of any episode we put out. Yeah, and you don't have to sponsor the show to give suggestions. Like, we will yep. take any and all subject, any and all suggestions. Just email us, enter the at gmail.com. Um, but anyway, Jackson, your wish is coming true. We are covering the Yuba County Five, and your, I can't believe I hadn't heard of this. Theory. Your wish is my command. Your wish is my command. <laughs> yeah, no, I've heard of the Yuba Five. Uh, I didn't recognize it at first. I, was, I, first, I, I thought it was like a town that disappeared, Ugh. and then I looked it up, and I was like, oh, I've heard of it's this. It's like Roanoke. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I thought it was a town, but no, it's uh, a group of friends that disappeared on a winter night in the mountains. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I don't know. The more I read, it was a fun one to research because I didn't know about it. But like, I don't know if it's that mysterious <laughs> that everyone leads it on to be. But I don't know. Could be. So we've got some theories. So we're going to cover that tonight. Um, before we jump in, though, uh, the wife and I went and saw Oppenheimer oh, okay. this week. Holy shit. It's pretty good. Like, I would say top three favorite movies ever. It was explosive. You would absolutely enjoy it. Oh, yeah. Saw it in IMAX. So it was really loud, really in your face. Holy Shit, it was amazing. If you have the chance to see it, highly recommend it. While yeah. we're doing the Yuba 5, Cleet, what are you going to be filling in with? Well, you know, I'll be talking about Forest Rangers. So I'll be covering a Reddit thread called Forest Rangers. What are your unexplainable and downright creepy stories? I think we could do that solo. I figured, you know, disappearing in the woods. Oh, yeah. That's kind of kind of a good thing. <clears throat> I agree. That Malort has ruined my mouth. Yeah. It's bad. I apologize, Cleet. It's like I it was apologize. gasoline. You're going to die. <laughs> I made you think it was a high-end whiskey. I'm a, her- I'm a terrible friend. 
but you had to try it, and it's over. I will never. I mean, I guess that's just payback for giving me a beer that was called terrible. So. <laughs> Fuck we'll, you. We'll <laughs> you like us. I am going to unsubscribe. <laughs> I fucking hate you. That guy got so mad. That was a mean I will email. never Who listen to a waiting. show that sponsors terrible beer. He hated us. It's like, how many beers have we had? Like, we've, pro- we've had like hundreds of beers yeah, now. Yeah, we will drink any beer. Any beer. Any beer. That's yeah. true. All right. So let's dive in to the Yuba County Five. In February 1978, a disturbing mystery took hold in California when five disabled young men, after returning home from a basketball game, vanished. Four of their bodies were found months later, leaving one of them still missing, never to be found. This is the story of the Yuba County Five. Before they became known as the Yuba County Five, the group of young men were fondly referred to as the boys by their loved ones. They were a close-knit group of friends from Yuba City, California. Bill Sterling, 29, Jack Hewitt, 24, Ted Wire, 32, Jack Madruga, 30, and Gary Mathias, 25, made up this group. All of these men struggled with mild developmental disabilities or psychiatric conditions of some sort. Gary Mathias was stationed in West Germany as part of his U.S. Army service during the early 70s where he developed drug problems. This ultimately led to him being diagnosed with schizophrenia and being given a psychiatric discharge. Matthias then returned to his parents' home in Yuba City, beginning treatment at a local mental hospital. Things were challenging at first as he was nearly arrested for assault two separate times and often experiencing psychotic episodes that put him in a local Veterans Administration hospital. He started treatment on an outpatient basis with Stelazine and and Cogentin, being considered by his physicians as one of their sterling success cases. While not working in his stepfather's gardening business, Matthias spent a lot of time with his family and four buddies who also shared intellectual abilities. Sterling and Hewitt were considered slow learners. Madruga was also an Army veteran. All of the men lived with their parents in Yuba City near Marysville. The group loved sports, specifically basketball, and when together they were either playing games or watching them. They played on a team called the Gateway Gators, which was supported by a local program for people with mental disabilities. So, like, just to get a feel for these guys, like, they're just good guys. Like, of, of course, the one struggled with the drugs and everything, but they've got, like, the, the, the learning disabilities, but they're a really close-knit group of friends in Yuba, love basketball. Um, like, if they're not with their families, they're with each other, they're playing sports and everything. So just a really good group of people. A close-knit group of fun people. Very much so. The Gators were set to play their first game in a week-long tournament, which was sponsored by the Special Olympics, granting the winners a free week in Los Angeles. The guys prepared for this exciting game the night before, laying out uniforms, packing bags, and even asking their parents to wake them up on time. So they're genuinely, like, thrilled for this basketball game the next morning. The night before, they decided to make the trip to Chico in support of the U.S. Davis basketball team during an away game against Chico State campus. Madruga and Matthias were the only two with driver's licenses, so Madruga decided to drive them the 50 miles north in his turquoise and white 1969 Mercury Montego. The temperature was cool in Sacramento Valley that time of the year, so the men set off wearing light coats. That night, the Davis team had won the game. The guys loaded back up into the car and drove a short distance to a bearer's market in downtown Chico. There they bought some snacks, soda, and cartons of chocolate milk to enjoy on the trip home. Ooh, chocolate milk. Chocolate milk with candy and soda. It just, I mean, look, it doesn't... Pretty good combo. It's not my combo, but hey, I'm not going to (laughs) judge. Some Diet Coke and Mentos. Yeah, in the car. I just imagine, like, sipping a Coke and then straight into some chocolate milk with some, like, candy and, like... God, that's a stomach ache waiting to happen. Mix it together at once. Just put it in a big bucket and mix yeah. it all together. That's a good drive home. They had arrived just before the store's closing time of 10 o'clock p.m. The clerk on duty recalled being annoyed at such a large group coming in and stalling her process of closing the store up for the night. Can you imagine just being like, fucking kids coming in wait right before I close? And then like you Probably find out later. Around. That, yeah. yeah. Like, but like that's the last time like someone saw them. It's crazy. A witness saw them drive off in the direction of Yuba City. Unfortunately, this was the last time the group of men were seen alive. Some of the boys' parents waited up for them, anxious for their safe arrival home. Others woke up to find that they had not returned. 
They weren't the type to stay out all night, which caused a panic, especially as they were so eager and excited to get to their basketball game that next morning. Madruga's mother phoned the police, which began the search for the Yuba County Five. But first, to you, Cleet. Uh, commercial break. All right. So we'll turn back to creepy disappearances in the forest. This one is from Deleted. I told this story on Let's Not Meet, but I'm happy to tell it again. In 2016, my boyfriend, now my husband, and I went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop at for the night was primitive. Camping was free, no self-service, barely a road, etc. We did encounter two other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy, so I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off the side of the road as we drove past. She had, a, she had the hood open, and it seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer her help. Usually, my boyfriend had no problem helping someone, but he said that this time, something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help, and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. Maybe I'm just a shitty person, but like, life has taught me that like if you see something suspicious like that, just keep going. Oh, yeah. Like, hitchhiking's not a thing anymore. I, I just don't trust people. You like, if you're in the middle of nowhere. A, a single woman with, like, eight kids. Like, I mean. <laughs> on, like, an abandoned highway. Just like, please help. And you're like, ah, no. Uh, are these kids alive? There's this one time I stopped at, uh, I was leaving, I think, Moab. And I stopped at this really, like, small town to get gas. And when I was leaving on the freeway, some guy was, like, hitchhiking. Nope. And I picked a hitchhiker up before. But I looked at him and I got this really bad vibe. So like I kind of slowed down and then I went. <laughs> he slowed down, like teased him. No, he got pissed. Like he got so mad. He was like <laughs> swearing and cursing. I'm like, I'm glad I didn't pick him up because I felt like there was something wrong with him. Yeah, we but, probably wouldn't have a podcast because yeah. <laughs> like Cleet would be dead. Murdered. He'd be stabbed in the middle of wherever the hell you were. So Flipping she, him off as you drive. <laughs> Flip him off. Jesus, Cleet. <laughs> she looked like she just expected we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said, anyways. I hadn't really noticed anything that's strange about her. The next person came when we had a chosen spot and we were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time it was the same car. And the man in the car watched us each time he passed. That's fucking odd. It's yeah. a setup. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. That's why you don't stop, because you stop to help her. Like, you're going to wake up three days later, your kidney's missing, you're missing all your molars, and you've got a weird, strange coin in your pocket. <laughs> my eyes! My <laughs> eyes! Well, my eyes! It had been raining, and everything was muddy, and we wanted the driest site possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy, too. If he wanted to find us, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time, so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything else to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m., we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like, but my boyfriend said it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. <laughs> oh, no, no, thank you. Was this predator? Like, like, what's the, is it, that's the last thing you want to hear when you're camping. <laughs> Who the fuck brought the chain gun? I got that machine gun permit from the government. Wait, what? <laughs> they, they allow chain guns now? With this permit, they do. <laughs> Welcome to America. <laughs> Jesus Christ, a chain gun? It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker <laughs> is another way he described it. That is such an interesting like, sound to think it's of. in your tent and you hear that? No. He jumped up and looked out the little window but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself another few times. I was too scared to speak, so my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should go back to sleep. I didn't question this, as I figured loud sounds could easily be heard miles off. After we left, he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road, but he didn't want to freak me out. <laughs> he lied to you. He's like, go to sleep. It's so far away. Holy shit. It's totally safe. <laughs> oh, Jesus, we're fucked. Just snuggle me. We're all right. 
Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was far off. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> it's so far away. Be fucking quiet. It's really far. Don't be fucking scared. Don't be too loud, but noise travels so far away. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed because we were leaving. I got alarmed by this and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete <laughs> Whoa. we had brought just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own, but despite the moon providing plenty of light, I couldn't really see. I did point out something my boyfriend hadn't noticed, though, before we got into the car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hasn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. Wah, wah, wah. While we were driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous someone might have been trying to lure us out. So he didn't think it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find our gas tank had been siphoned out. But that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joked that would make a funny hybrid commercial. <laughs> That's actually kind of funny. <laughs> you siphon, but we got a battery, motherfucker. <laughs> Just some, like, rural people, like, like sitting in the bush, like, we got him now. Oh, we got him. The guy's in there taking out his machete, whispering to his wife. That's a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid, two. We only joked because we were about shitting ourselves from fear and adrenaline even then. The rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites or got a hotel. Smart. Very smart. You learn from your experience of almost dying from a chain gun. This one is from Frivolous. Traditionally, not a ranger, but... But... My story is the exact reverse of the others here. Oh, you're what? breaking the rules, he, Frivolous. No, he was the creep. <laughs> <laughs> I, w I found this trailer, and I was drinking a beer can and rattling up my chain gun. I pissed in their fire, and I siphoned their gas. When I was in the scouts, or rather the local equivalent, legally adult scouts, had to do the three feather challenge. Is that where you put three feathers in your butt? And oh, then, yeah. Just okay. jam it up there. <laughs> one day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen fuck? by any human, after which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the camp, the camp master. Never like heard of that. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods, and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn when I decided to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing, so decided to go back. Yeah, you don't want <laughs> he was the naked dude in the forest. <laughs> yeah, you don't want, you don't want to... <laughs> That's what he's saying. Oh, my God. <laughs> Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in, <laughs> and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was oh. a pit where poachers dumped guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. <laughs> Oh, so he's naked in, like, fermented oh, deer? Blood and shit. All right, imagine the scene. A group of anglers hear some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods huh. and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten offal who is crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground <laughs> while shrieking and weeping, then runs at them. To get, to get to the lake and wash off. Yeah. He's lucky no. he didn't get shot. Yeah, he would have been shot immediately. <laughs> oh, my God, David. Good, good. Dead. God. What Reddit thread have you found? It's good, huh? It's good Holy one. Lord. Okay. We're going to jump back to the Yuba County Five. Police in Butte and Yuba counties began their search along the route the men had taken to Chico. The search turned up nothing, as there were no signs of them between Chico and Yuba City. By seemingly pure luck, a U.S. Forest Service ranger happened to spot Madruga's car stuck in a snowbank in the Plumas National Forest on February 27th. This remote road was roughly 50 miles in the opposite direction the men should have been traveling on their way home. So that's like the first issue. Like, they were supposed to be going home, but their car was found 50 miles in the opposite direction, up a fucking mountain. What happened? At the time of the discovery, the ranger had considered it insignificant, as many residents often took that road into the Sierra Nevada on winter weekends to participate in some skiing. It wasn't until he read the missing person's bulletin that he recognized the car. 
at which point he led deputies to it on February the 28th. The discovery of this car only added to the increasing list of questions that this case presented. Inside the car, the evidence suggested that they had been inside the car between when they were last seen and when it was abandoned. The empty candy wrappers, cartons, and cans of their snacks and beverages were, were there, along with a neatly folded map of California and programs from the game that they had attended. It didn't seem like the men had tried to move the car either, which would have been very easy to do with five of them there. The car reportedly also had a quarter tank of gas left. The keys to the car were missing. The men's families couldn't guess as to why the car was so far off route, or why they had attempted to drive into the mountains on a winter night, deep into a high elevation remote forest, while only wearing light jackets on the night before their big game. Like, that doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, who knows? What could have, what compelling force could have driven them it just, to that road? It just wasn't adding up. In discussing with the men's families, Madruga's parents mentioned that he didn't like the cold weather at all and had never been up into the mountains. Sterling's dad recalled taking his son to the area near where the car was found on a fishing trip for the weekend. Apparently, he disliked it so much he remained home for any future trips his dad took later on. He's like, yeah, just don't bring me anymore. I'm just going to stay home. I never I want to go it. back there. <laughs> He's like, don't you even ask. I will not go. What baffled police was why the men had left the car in the first place. They had reached 4,400 feet in elevation along the road, which was about where the snow line was that time of year. They were close to where the road was closed for the winter, and the car had been stuck in some snow drifts. But as previously mentioned, no signs showed they tried to move it, which again would easily have been done with five adult males. The keys being gone indicated to the police that they had left with the intention of returning later after possibly finding help. Police hotwired the car, which started up immediately. The car was towed back to the station so they could conduct a more thorough examination. The Montego had no dents, gouges, or mud scrapes on the undercarriage or low hanging muffler. This was odd as it was driven up a mountain road full of bumps and ruts. This would indicate one of two things. The driver was either super careful, or it was someone who was familiar with the road, which Madruga was not. At this discovery, Madruga's family made it clear that he would not have let someone else drive his car. The car was unlocked and had a window rolled down when it was found, which was also suspicious to the family. He would never have left it so unsecure. Police immediately began searching the surrounding woods, but were forced to stop due to a brutal winter storm. No trace of the men were found besides the abandoned car. In response to the local media coverage, police began receiving several reports of some or all the men being sighted after leaving Chico. Some reports even reported them being seen elsewhere in California or the country. You always hear that, though. When, like, yeah. A case blows up. Someone's like, oh, I saw him. They were I in Mexico. In he was jumping on a pile of glass for money. <laughs> God, is that a thing they do in Venice? I saw him as a kid once, but he never did it. Wow, really? Yeah, he just kept saying, I'm going to jump at this pile of glass. I need you to put money. For money? Most of these reports were easily dismissed. However, two of the sightings stood out from the rest of them. A bizarre story made its way into the case from a man named Joseph Scons about the evening of February 24th. Joseph Scons, who resided in Sacramento, told police that he had been driving up that same road to check on a cabin before his family ski trip the following weekend. He had inadvertently spent the night there as he had gotten stuck in the snow. As he was attempting to free his vehicle, he began to have a heart attack. He got back into his vehicle and kept the engine running for heat. Roughly six hours later, Scons saw headlights coming up behind him. He looked out the window to see a car parked right behind him, headlights on with a group of people standing around it. He said one of them appeared to be a woman holding a baby. He called out for help, at which point they stopped talking and turned the headlights off. He then recalled seeing more lights from behind, this time appearing to be flashlights, which again went out as soon as he called out for help. Isn't that fucking weird? That is weird. It's really weird. I mean, this it's guy's having a heart attack, and like these lights show up, and it's like a group of people just getting out to talk right behind him, and a lady with a baby. It's fucking weird, man. Scons also recalls a pickup truck parking 20 feet behind him for a moment, and then continuing down the road. He told the police that he couldn't be completely sure of that as he was most likely delirious from the pain he was experiencing. Scon's car ran out of gas early the next morning. 
His pain had subsided enough for him to walk eight miles down the road, eight miles down the road to a lodge where the manager drove him home. They passed the Montego at the point where he recalled hearing voices from. Doctors later confirmed that he had, in fact, suffered a mild heart attack. That would fucking suck. Driving up the mountain, you get stuck in a snowbank, and then you have a heart attack. Like, oh, those people will help me. Nope. No, thanks. They lady. turned off their flashlights because they didn't <laughs> want to have anything to do with it. The them. lady and her baby just fucked right off. After this story made its way into the case, Wire's mother said that he would never ignore someone's plea for help. And if he had indeed been there and seen the man having a heart attack, he would have assisted. She recalled a time when he and Sterling helped someone they knew get to a hospital after overdosing on Valium. The other notable report came from a woman working at a store in the small town of Brownsville, which was 30 miles from where their car had been abandoned. They would have reached this store had they continued down the road. On March 3rd, the woman who had seen flyers with the men's pictures and the reward being offered of $1,215, which is $5,500 as of 2022, told deputies that four of the men had stopped at the store in a red pickup truck only two days after the disappearance. The store owner corroborated her story. She stated that she knew the men were not from the area due to their big eyes and facial expressions. The two men she identified as Hewitt and Sterling were in a telephone booth outside the store, while the other two were inside. Police deemed her a credible witness and took her account seriously. Further details from the store owner were given as he told investigators that the men he believed to be Wire and Hewitt had come in buying burritos, chocolate milk, and soft drinks. Yeah, I mean, that so that's matches. kind of the weird thing, right? Like, it matches. At least, like, the, the chocolate milk and the... How many times have you gotten chocolate milk in your life at a store? <laughs> as an adult? As an adult, none. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've bought my kids chocolate milk, but as an adult, like, no. I have chocolate milk and a burrito. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and soft weird, drinks. Weird combination. Wire's brother told the Los Angeles Times that while driving to Brownsville in a different car, in apparent ignorance of the basketball game seemed completely out of character for them, which is 100% true. The owner's further description of the men's behavior seemed consistent, however, as Wire would eat anything he could get his hands on and was often accompanied by Hewitt more than the others. Hewitt's brother said Jack hated using phones so much that he would answer calls for Jack when his buddies would call him. As the evidence was pointing nowhere and with no clear conclusion on what happened that night, police and families didn't rule out the possibility of foul play. That was until the snow started melting in the spring. But before we go any further, Cleet, back to you for some more forest disappearances. All right, this one is from... Or strange shit. Yeah, strange shit in the forest. By uh, apparently people who are not forest rangers. They did not follow the rules. I know. But, uh, okay. St. Pariah writes, One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeast U.S. Okay, here we go. Hey! I mean, technically, he's not a ranger, so he's still kind of breaking it. But, uh, okay. But, it's about a ranger. Haven't spoken in years, as as is the case with H, but I remember about eight to nine years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park several days in a row and found out that they were visiting from out west, and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot they'd taken pics of where he popped the question, but were having trouble. After looking at the pics and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought it would be. They found it, and he left him there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave. So he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards, and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both committed suicide by ingesting some sort of chemical-slash-pill combination medley. Jesus Christ. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My bud wasn't torn up about it. He was obviously sad for about them dying, but said that he thought they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think they helped kill them. This one is from Sand Dorgan. To be clear, I'm not forestry. I just have a related story. 
My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana, Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there with her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure no contaminants. So I thought that sounded like fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights, so we packed up all our gear and saddlebags or saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and an amazing air quality. It really is so peaceful out there. I love that area and wish I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day and my cousin said, you want to see something weird? Would you say yes to that? Oh, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'll go see it. It's I weird. mean, like, if anyone asks, hey, do you want to see something weird or creepy? Always yes. It's weird and floppy. Unless they, yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> unless, <laughs> unless they start to, like, unzip their pants. I'm like, hey, stop. No! Like, I don't consent to that. You fucking pervert. <laughs> I said weird, not sexual. Get out of here. <laughs> I knew you were going that way, too. That's why I was trying to clarify before you started to, like, go that route. I'm like, hang on, hang on, hang on. There's some caveats to that. I don't want to see a penis. Let's just start there. Okay? <laughs> All right. All right, back to the story. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> Unless this, this is going to weird, like... Penis thing. I don't know, man. I mean... <laughs> of course I said yes. So she led me on a bit of a side journey into a tiny little ravine. We, we ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path we laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing, and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It was one of those things you can plug in or wind up, and it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries pretty quick. I do, and out in the middle of the fucking nowhere, there is a huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. Mm -hmm. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like someone buried transmission wire, but a small, like, 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the bush and trees. So naturally, I decided to follow the damn thing out of curiosity. Yeah, good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees, then back to the ground, and then snakes around rocks and finally deadens into an outlet. What the fuck? The outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. The hell? I am staring confused as all hell at this desk in the middle of the forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord, and plugs it into the outlet. That fucker then lights up and started blaring static. <laughs> the wire was being fed from somewhere... Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around, and yet there was a live outlet. Weird as shit. No spooky jump scares or bodies, just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish I had taken a picture of it. That I is, wish you had taken a picture of it, too. That is the strangest fucking thing I've ever heard. Just sit down and get some work done, man. Easy secret underground military base. They put Johnson's desk up there because he was annoying. <laughs> like, fuck Johnson. Hello, Johnson. Do your fucking report in the know, woods, you ass. I don't know how you survived the flood, but you're annoying, and that's where your desk is. <laughs> it's like office space. I'm going to move you to the basement. What? This is not where my stable is. This is not where my stable is. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and close out the story of the Yuba County Five. On June 4th, as most of the higher elevation snow melted, a group of motorcyclists discovered a Forest Service trailer in the woods, roughly 20 miles from where the abandoned car had been found. The front window of the trailer had been broken. They opened the door and were immediately overcome with the foul odor, which came from a body that was later identified as wires. His body had been stretched out onto a bed, wrapped in eight sheets, with his feet being severely frostbitten. His body was emaciated, and the length of his beard suggested that he had been alive for roughly two to three months after disappearing. That's a long time. Yeah. The autopsy showed that he had died of a combination of both starvation and hypothermia. He had lost half of his 200 pounds. On a table next to him were some of his belongings, including his wallet with some cash, a nickel ring with Ted engraved on it, and a gold necklace he also wore. 
Also on the table was a gold watch without its crystal, but Wire's family said that did not belong to him, and a partially melted candle. He was wearing a velour shirt and lightweight pants. A velour shirt. However, his shoes could not be found. The really strange part was that although he had broken into the trailer, he never opened a locker in the shed which contained enough food to feed all five of the men for more than a year. He had never used any matches, fuel, or propane from a tank located in another shed to keep the trailer warm. It appeared that he had broken in and spent months waiting to die. Wire's family said that he lacked common sense as a result of his mental disability, often asking questions like why he should stop at a stop sign. One night, he had to be dragged out of bed during a house fire as he was afraid he would miss his job interview if he got up. So literally their entire house was on fire and his parents had to drag him from the bed because he was so worried about a, a job interview. So again, I mean, it's, it's good to point out because like they, they did have his disability, so like the common thinking just wasn't there. Yeah. It appeared that Wire had not been alone in the trailer and that Matthias and possibly Hewitt had been there with him. Matthias' sneakers were in the trailer and the C rations were opened with the P38 can opener, which only Matthias and Madruga would have been familiar with due to their military background. It suggested that Matthias' feet could have been swollen from frostbite and had perhaps put on wire shoes to venture outside. The sheets that covered wire indicated that someone else might have been there with him also because his feet would have been so painful like he couldn't have wrapped himself in those sheets. That makes sense. Searchers returned to Plumas following the road between the trailer and where the car was left. The next day, they found the remains that were identified later as Madruga and Sterling on opposite sides of the road, roughly 11 and a half miles from where the car was found. Madruga's body had been partially consumed by scavenging animals, while only bones remained of Sterling, which were scattered over a very small area. Autopsies confirmed that they had both died of hypothermia. Deputies suggested that one of them may have given in to the need to sleep, which comes with the final stages of hypothermia, while the other one stayed by his side, only to die the same way. Like, that's pretty sad, man. Like, you and your friend are walking through just fucking bitter cold snow. Hypothermia sets in. You're like, I'm, I'm tired. I'm, I'm, I need to go to bed. And you and like, never woke up. So yeah, and he sad. sleeps, and then the other friend's like, well, I'll just stay here with you. I don't want to leave you alone. And they fucking both die. Two days later, during a search party, Hewitt's father found his son's backbone under a manzanita bush, roughly two miles northeast of the trailer. Like, can you imagine finding your son's backbone? Jesus, man. His shoes and jeans were nearby, which helped identify the body. The day after that, a deputy sheriff found a skull about 300 feet downhill from the bush, which was confirmed by dental records to belong to Hewitt. His death was also attributed to hypothermia. Northwest of the trailer, about a quarter mile away, searchers found three Forest Service blankets and a rusted flashlight by the road. It could not be determined how long these items had been there, though. Since Matthias had presumably not taken his medication, pictures were distributed of him to mental institutions all over California. However, no trace of him has ever been found, so Matthias was the only one out of the five that they had not found. His sneakers were discovered in the trailer, indicating that he had been inside at some point, but that was about all they had to go on. Matthias' father said, What I looked for all the time I was up there were his glasses. I didn't think the bear would eat that. So, he's just assuming that this a bear got to him. That's a weird assumption. Yeah. Alright, so now we get into some of the theories behind this crazy tale. Investigators could not completely explain what led them to their deaths or why they were even up there to begin with. They did learn that Matthias had friends in the small town of Forbes Town and believe it's possible that in an attempt to visit them on the way home from the game, they may have taken a wrong turn near Oroville, which put them on the mountain road. This was hard to believe, however, as they had left the car instead of going back down the road in the direction that they were originally going and purposeful motion of that nature. It's not consistent with the circular patterns traveled by those who are genuinely believe themselves to be lost. So, like, if they genuinely thought they were lost, they would have circled back, dug the car out, gone back down the road. Sure. So Makes sense. The day before they went missing, a USFS snowcat went along that road to clear snow off the trailer roof to prevent it from collapsing. Police believe the group could have decided to follow these tracks through the snowdrifts, believing shelter wasn't too far away. 
If this were the case, most likely, Madruga and Sterling died roughly halfway through the walk. It's assumed that once they found the trailer, the remaining three broke the window to enter as it was locked, possibly thinking it to be private property and fearing arrest for theft if they used anything there. So they're literally thinking, like, they broke in, thinking, oh, it's private property, so we can't use anything because we're going to be charged for theft. So, like, they're like, you didn't lose anything, you didn't use anything in the trailer, but they're like, oh, they maybe thought they were going to be arrested for it, which, if it's for survival, <laughs> fucking steal something, man. Like, start a fire. Once Wire had died, the remaining two may have decided to head out to find civilization. Investigators were never able to find evidence of a woman and a baby, but the family still believe in the idea of nefarious deeds taking place. Wire's sister-in-law said, They seen something at that game at the parking lot. They might have seen it and didn't realize they seen it, suggesting that they were killed to cover up some form of crime, which I don't believe in. No matter what you believe, to this day the mystery of the Yuba County Five baffles investigators more than 40 years later. In the words of Jack Beecham, the Yuba County undersheriff during the time of the disappearance, the incident remains bizarre as hell. I have a theory. What's that? It was Matthias, right? Yeah. He's the only one that survived. Had schizophrenia. Okay. Probably had a Didn't take his medication. Delusion. Yeah. And drove up there because he thought he was being followed. Guy comes up with headlights, so there's a car up there. He freaks out. Okay. Thinks he's still being followed. Goes, all right, guys, we got to, like, get out of here now. Like, we're, 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 we're going to be killed. We're going to be killed. And those those guys are like, oh, okay. And they just followed him. That's what happened. Okay. That's my theory. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's weird because, like, I don't know. It, it's really sad. But, like, obviously, like, the families and everything had, like, said, like, look, they didn't use common sense. You know, they they struggled. They had the disabilities. Well, if you have a strong personality and you're in a delusional state you could be convincing right and people that are easily convinced yeah right so i mean i agree like it if i was in that situation it, someone's like we're being followed we got to go up this road i'd be like yeah i'm out i'm gonna get see out of the car see you. i'm gonna right? go walk down the mountain um but yeah so i mean like i personally i just think that like obviously i don't know maybe they got turned around the car got stuck something like that happened you're like oh you know they're, we're being followed or whatever they ran into the woods and they, it was cold there was nowhere to like take shelter Two of them died along the way. They found the trailer. They were afraid of starting a fire. <laughs> like, they, they died. Like, it's it sucks. But Matthias has been missing. Like, where would he go? What would you say? Like, what's your theory on that? Maybe he just went out in the woods and died. They haven't found him. It's Maybe he went further place. away. Yeah. Yeah, it is a big place. Because if he's paranoid, his friends start dying. I just thought they were getting close, and he booked it in the woods. Yeah. I mean... I think the bear thing's pretty weird unless there was evidence like specifically of like scavengers. A bear. Right. Like there's always the bears are gonna leave behind evidence. Like they might poop out clothing and things like that. Like why would you assume it's a bear? I don't know though. I mean they were eaten by something. Oh well that's scavenger animals is what you said. So it's right. post mortem. Right. And that that would be expected, but it doesn't mean it's bears. Right, no, that's what I'm saying. Like something ate them, but he's just like, oh, the bear would you eat would them. You would expect like, scavengers if someone died in the woods. Yeah. So. Of course. It's weird. It's sad. But, I mean, like, it's, you know, it's unfortunate. I always like to throw in a theory when something like this happens. Aliens. Aliens. Yeah, yeah, aliens. I always like to throw the alien theory Kill. in there. I do think it's really weird, though, that, like, that guy's like, I saw a woman and a baby. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm sure it was off. he was in so much pain and, like, delirious that he was just seeing stuff. But still, like, you see a woman and know. a baby on the mountain. I don't know. It's really weird. So, anyway, that is the story of the Yuba County Five. Thank you very much, Jackson, for the suggestion. It was a really fun one to cover. Again, throwing it out to everybody. Um, if you want to be a paid subscriber of the show, here's you know, click the link. If not, that's fine. All anytime, throw a suggestion out there. We will cover it. So back to the desk. Sandargan replies to a question he's asked, and oh. he says the desk looked like it had been in place for a few years at least. Not incredibly rusty, but weathered. It was around 2001 or 2003, I think. We were not near any large bodies of water. I know there is a small stream in the area. I do not think I did. They're asking if he opened up the uh, drawers. He says, I do not remember opening any drawers or finding anything in them, at least. I'm going to say, like, if you see a desk, you got to open the drawers. Could you imagine opening the drawers and just seeing... A severed like, head. You know, just Kermit the Frog memorabilia. Like, all sorts of different things. That'd be weird. Yeah. Specifically Kermit the Frog. Yeah, only Kermit the Frog. I mean, hey, it's something. Uh, this one is from Deleted. I've got a deep wood story that's been shared in my family for quite a few years. Like, this is a gold thread. Damn. But, 
My great uncle was deep in the woods kind of guy. In a practice, I find a little weird. He would rarely use a tent, just set up a sleeping <laughs> bag right on the ground. Since we're in Maine, there aren't too many large predators that really mess with people. There are black bears, but they are usually but they usually hide from people. So I guess he didn't feel worried. So he's out there sleeping in the woods when he feels a tiny hand pat- patting his face. Oh, no. fuck no. <laughs> Wakes up. Opens his eyes to see a raccoon standing over him, just Uh-oh. feeling his face. <laughs> so what does my great uncle do? He just goes back to sleep. Punches the <laughs> raccoon. He's like, I'm fucking sleeping. And they do like to put their little mitts on everything. Oh, that's funny. Right, this one is from Maggie A. I was camping in the Everglades. As I mentioned in another post, due to back problems, I sleep on, I sleep in the back of my car. What I didn't mention is it's a convertible with a cloth top. I hear something walking on it. I know it's a raccoon, and I can't, and I can tell it's pretty heavy. I'm worried he'll rip through the top, so I push at it to try to get him off. He leaves but comes back. This goes on for a while. Then it stops, so I try to go to sleep. It was December, but it was warm, so I had the windows open. I hear something, and when I open my eyes, the raccoon is sitting in the <laughs> driver's seat, staring at me over the back of it. I chase him out. Still can't sleep, so I go to the bathroom. Next morning, I get up, and the wrapper from the loaf of bread that I had stored in the well behind the back seat, where the convertible top folds into, is lying out there empty under a tree. Oh, shit. He still. When I was in the bathroom, the raccoon had climbed in and stolen it. I felt sorry for the raccoon. That was eight slices of double fiber bread. 18. (laughs) So 126 grams of fiber in one city. I can only imagine what it did to his digestive system. Oh, man. I was walking out and just saw a giant shit. (laughs) Raccoon took off, man. All right. Well, that is going to wrap up our episode for this evening. Again, thank you very much, Jackson, for the suggestion. I had a lot of fun covering that one. And we'll probably come back to this Reddit thread sometime soon. But as we wrap up, as always, a huge shout out to our paid supporters of the show. Jackson, Supernatural Tessa, Modelo Time, Mothman, Devin C, Conklin Family, and Lou. Thank you all very much for your contributions to the show. If you want to become a paid supporter, again, the link is down below. We're definitely going to put it to good use. We want to eventually get video on the show. And with that being said, I'll toss it over to Cleet for the YouTube stuff. Okay, if you're listening to us on YouTube, please like, share, and subscribe. We're only 154 subs away from you guys forcing us to go to the Clown Motel, <laughs> which we'll, we will have a video camera, and we'll do a mockumentary of, uh, you know, the ghosts in that spooky place. With uh, Ouija board, spirit box, all of the above. Ghost rods, we're going to do a bunch of shit. And, and alcohol. Alcohol, alcohol yeah. will be involved. As always, thank you for entering the abyss. Until next time.